Section 10, Part 3 of Section 3 of the Introduction of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J. C. Guan. Commentaries on the Laws of England by William Blackston. Book 1. Introduction. Section 3. Part 3. The canon law is a body of Roman ecclesiastical law, relative to such matters as that church either has, or pretends to have, the proper jurisdiction over. This is compiled from the opinions of the ancient Latin fathers, the decrees of general councils, the decretal epistles and bulls of the Holy See, all which lay in the same disorder and confusion as the Roman civil law, till about the year 1151, one Grecian, an Italian monk, animated by the discovery of Justinian's pandex at Amalfi, reduced them into some method in three books, which he entitled Concordia Discordantium Canonum, but which are generally known by the name of Decretum Graciani. These reached as low as the time of Pope Alexander the Third. The subsequent papal decrees to the pontificate of Gregory IX were published in much the same method under the auspices of that Pope about the year 1230 in five books entitled Decretalia Gregori Noni. A sixth book was added by Boniface the Eighth about the year 1298 which is called Sextus Decretalium. The Clementine Constitutions, or Decrees of Clement V, were in like manner authenticated in 1317 by his successor John the Twenty Second, who also published twenty constitutions of his own, called the Extravagantes Giovannis, all which in some measure answer to the novels of the civil law. To these have been since added some decrees of later popes in five books, called Extravagantes Communes, and all these together, Gratian's Decree, Gregory's Decretals, the Sixth Decretal, the Clementine Constitutions, and the Extravagance of John and his successors, form the Corpus Iuri Canonici, or Body of the Roman Canon Law. Besides these pontifical collections, which during the times of popery were received as authentic in this island, as well as in other parts of Christendom. There is also a kind of national canon law, composed of legatine and provincial constitutions, and adopted only to the exigencies of this church and kingdom. The legatine constitutions were ecclesiastical laws, enacted in national synods, held under the cardinals Otho and Otsobon, legates from Pope Gregory IX and Pope Adrian IV, in the reign of King Henry III, about the years 1220 and 1268. The provincial constitutions are principally the decrees of provincial synods, held on the diverse archbishops of Canterbury, from Stephen Langton, in the reign of Henry III, to Henry Tuchelli, in the reign of Henry V, and adopted also by the province of York, in the reign of Henry VI, at the dawn of the Reformation, in the reign of King Henry VIII, it was enacted in Parliament that a review should be had of the canon law, and till such review should be made, all canons, constitutions, ordinances, and synodal provincial being then already made, and not repugnant to the law of the land or the king's prerogative, should still be used and executed. And, as no such review has yet been perfected, upon this statute now depends the authority of the canon law in England. As for the canons enacted by the clergy under James I in the year 1603, and never confirmed in Parliament, it has been solely adjudged upon the principles of law and the constitution, 
that where they are not merely declaratory of the ancient canon law, but are introductory of new regulations, they do not bind the laity, whatever regard the clergy may think proper to pay them. There are four species of courts in which the civil and canon laws are permitted, under different restrictions, to be used. 1. The courts of the archbishops and bishops and their derivative officers, usually called in our law courts Christian, curiae Christianitatis, or the ecclesiastical courts. 2. The military courts. 3. The courts of admiralty. 4. The courts of the two universities. In all, the reception in general, and the different degrees of that reception, are grounded entirely upon custom, corroborated in the latter instance by Act of Parliament, ratifying those charters which confirm the customary law of the universities. The more minute consideration of these will fall properly under that part of these commentaries which treats of the jurisdiction of courts. It will suffice, at present, to remark a few particulars relative to them all, which may serve to inculcate more strongly the doctrine laid down concerning them. 1. And first, the courts of common law have the superintendency over these courts. To keep them within their jurisdictions, to determine wherein they exceed them, to restrain and prohibit such excess, and, in case of contumacy, to punish the officer who executes, and in some cases, the judge who enforces, the sentence so declared to be illegal. 2. The common law has reserved to itself the exposition of all such acts of Parliament, as concern either the extent of these courts, or the matters depending before them. And, therefore, if these courts either refuse to allow these acts of Parliament, or will expound them in any other sense than what the common law puts upon them, the King's courts at Westminster will grant prohibitions to restrain and control them. 3. An appeal lies from all these courts to the King, in the last resort, which proves that the jurisdiction exercised in them is derived from the crown of England, and not from any foreign patented or intrinsic authority of their own. And from these three strong marks and ensigns of superiority, it appears beyond a doubt that the civil and canon laws, though admitted in some cases by custom in some courts, are only subordinate and legis sub graviori lege, and that, thus admitted, restrained, altered, new modelled, and amended, they are by no means with us a distinct independent species of laws, but are inferior branches of the customary or unwritten laws of England, properly called the king's ecclesiastical, the king's military, the king's maritime, or the king's academical laws. Let us next proceed to the legis scripte, the written laws of the kingdom, which are statutes, acts, or edicts, made by the king's majesty, by and with the advice and content of the lords spiritual and temporal, and commons, in parliament assembled. The oldest of these now extant, and printed in our statute books, is the famous Magna Carta, as confirmed in Parliament, 9 Henry the Third, Though doubtless there were many acts before that time, the records of which are not lost, and the determinations of them, perhaps at present, currently received for the maxims of the old common law. The manner of making these statutes will be better considered hereafter, when we examine the constitution of Parliaments. At present, we only take notice of the different kinds of statutes, and of some general rules which regard their construction. First, as to their several kinds. Statutes are either general or special, public or private. 
a general or public act is a universal rule that regards the whole community, and of these the courts of law are bound to take notice judicially and ex officio, without the statute being particularly pleaded or formally set forth by the party who claims an advantage under it. Special or private acts are rather exceptions than rules, being those which only operate upon particular persons and private concerns, such as the Romans entitled Senatus Decreta, in contradistinction to the Senatus Consulta, which regarded the whole community. And of these, the judges are not bound to take notice, unless they be formally shown and pleaded. Thus, to show the distinction, the statute 13 Elizabeth chapter 10, to prevent spiritual persons from making leases for longer terms than twenty-one years, or three lives, is a public act, it being a rule prescribed to the whole body of spiritual persons in the nation, but an act to enable the Bishop of Chester to make a lease to A.B. for sixty years, is an exception to this rule. It concerns only the parties and the bishop's successors, and is therefore a private act. Statutes are also either declaratory of the common law, or remedial of some defects therein. Declaratory, where the old custom of the kingdom is almost fallen into disuse, or become disputable, in which case the parliament has thought proper, in perpetuum re testimonium, and for avoiding all doubts and difficulties, to declare what the common law is, and ever has been. Thus, the statute of treasons, 25, Edward the Third, chapter 2, does not make any new species of treasons, but only, for the benefit of the subject, declares and enumerates those several kinds of offence which before were treason at the common law. Remedial statutes are those which are made to supply such defects, and abrite such superfluities in the common law, as arise either from the general imperfection of all human laws, from change of time and circumstances, from the mistakes and unadvised determinations of unlearned judges, or from any other cause whatsoever. And, this being done, either by enlarging the common law where it was too narrow and circumscribed, or by restraining it where it was too lax and luxuriant. This has occasioned another subordinate division of remedial acts of Parliament into enlarging and restraining statutes. To instance again, in the case of treason, clipping the current coin of the kingdom was an offence not sufficiently guarded against by the common law. Therefore, it was thought expedient by statute 5, Elizabeth chapter 11, to make it high treason, which it was not at the common law, so that this was an enlarging statute. At common law also spiritual corporations might lease out their estates for any term of years, till prevented by the statute 13, Elizabeth, before mentioned. This was therefore a restraining statute. Secondly, the rules to be observed with regard to the construction of statutes are principally these which follow. 1. There are three points to be considered in the construction of all remedial statutes, the old law, the mischief, and the remedy, that is, how the common law stood at the making of the act, what the mischief was, for which the common law did not provide, and what remedy the Parliament has provided to cure this mischief. And it is the business of the judges so to construct the act, as to suppress the mischief and advance the remedy. Let us instance again in the same restraining statute of 13 Elizabeth. By the common law, ecclesiastical corporations might let as long leases as they thought proper. 
The mischief was that they let long and unreasonable leases to the impoverished of their successors. The remedy applied by the statute was by making void all leases by ecclesiastical bodies for longer terms than three lives or twenty-one years. Now, in the construction of this statute, it is held that leases, though for a longer term, if made by a bishop, are not void during the bishop's life, or, if made by a dean with concurrence of his chapter, they are not void during the life of the dean, for the act was made for the benefit and protection of the successor. The mischief is therefore sufficiently suppressed by vacating them after the death of the grantor, but the leases, during their lives, being not within the mischief, are not within the remedy. 2. A statute which treats of things or persons of an inferior rank cannot, by any general words, be extended to those of a superior. So a statute treating of deans, prebendaries, parsons, vicars, and other having spiritual promotion, is held not to extend to bishops, though they have spiritual promotion, deans being the highest persons named, and bishops being of a still higher order. 3. Penal statutes must be construed strictly. Thus, a statute 1 Edward the Sixth, having enacted that those who are convicted of stealing horses should not have the benefit of clergy. The judges conceived that this did not extend to him that should steal but one horse, and therefore procured a new act for that purpose in the following year. And, to come nearer to our times, by the statute 14 George the Second, chapter 6, stealing sheep or other cattle, was made felony without benefit of clergy. But these general words, or other cattle, being looked upon as much too loose to create a capital offence, the act was held to extend to nothing but mere sheep, and therefore, in the next sessions, it was found necessary to make another statute, 15 George the Second, chapter 34, extending the former to bulls, cows, oxen, steers, bullocks, heifers, cows, and lambs, by name. 4. Statutes against frauds are to be liberally and beneficially expounded. This may seem a contradiction to the last rule, most statutes against frauds being in their consequences penal. But this difference is here to be taken, where the statutes act upon the offender, and inflicts a penalty, as the pillory or a fine, it is then to be taken strictly. But when the statute acts upon the offence, by setting aside the fraudulent transaction, here it is to be construed liberally. Upon this footing, the statute of 13 Elizabeth, chapter 5, which avoids all gifts of goods, etc., made to defraud creditors and others, was held to extend by the general words to a gift made to defraud the queen of a forfeiture. 5. One part of a statute must be so construed by another that the whole may, if possible, stand, ut res magis valeat, quam pereat, as if land be vested in the king and his heirs by act of parliament, saving the right of A, and A has at that time a lease of it for three years. Here A shall hold it for his term of three years, and afterwards it shall go to the king. But this interpretation furnishes matter for every clause of the statute to work and operate upon. But, 6. A saving, totally repugnant to the body of the act, is void, if, therefore, an act of Parliament vests land in the king and his heirs, saving the right of all persons whatsoever, or vests the land of A in the king, 
saving the right of A. In either of these cases, the saving is totally repugnant to the body of the statute, and, if good, would render the statute of no effect or operation. And, therefore, the saving is void, and the land vests absolutely in the king. 7. Where the common law and the statute differ, the common law gives place to the statute, and an old statute gives place to a new one. And this, upon the general principle laid down in the last section, that legis posteriores priores contrarias abrogant. But this is to be understood only when the latter statute is couched in negative terms, or, by its matter, necessarily implies a negative as if a former act says that a juror upon such a trial shall have twenty pounds a year, and a new statute comes and says he shall have twenty marks. Here, the latter statute, though it does not express, yet necessarily implies a negative, and virtually repeals the former. For, if twenty marks be made qualification sufficient, the former statute which requires twenty pounds, is at an end. But, if both acts be merely affirmative, and the substance such that both may stand together, here the latter does not repeal the former, but they shall both have a concurrent efficacy. If by a former law an offence be indictable at the quarter sessions, and a lawful law makes the same offence indictable at the assizes, here the jurisdiction of these sessions is not taken away, but both have a concurrent jurisdiction, and the offender may be prosecuted at either, unless the new statute subjoins express negative words, as that the offence shall be indictable at the assizes, and not elsewhere. 8. If a statute that repeals another is itself repealed afterwards, the first statute is hereby revived without any formal words for that purpose. So when the statutes of 26 and 35 Henry VIII, declaring the king to be the supreme head of the church, were repealed by a statute 1 and 2, Philip and Mary, and this latter statute was afterwards repealed by an act of 1 Elizabeth, there needed not any express words of revival in Queen Elizabeth's statute, but these acts of King Henry were implied and virtually revived. 9. Acts of Parliament, derogatory from the power of subsequent Parliament, bind not. So the statute 11, Henry the Seventh, chapter 1, which directs that no person for assisting a king de facto shall be attained of treason, by act of Parliament or otherwise, is held to be good only as to common prosecutions for high treason, but will not restrain or clog any parliamentary attainder, because the legislature, being in truth the sovereign power, is always of equal, always of absolute authority. It acknowledged no superior upon earth, which the prior legislature must have been, if its ordinances could bind the present Parliament. And upon the same principle, Cicero, in his letters to Atticus, treats with a proper contempt these restraining clauses which endeavor to tie up the hands of succeeding legislatures. Quote, when you repeal the law itself, says he, you, at the same time, repeal the prohibitory clause which guards against such repeal. End quote. 10. Lastly, acts of Parliament that are impossible to be performed are of no validity, and if there arise out of them collaterally any absurd consequences, manifestly contradictory to common reason, they are, with regard to those collateral consequences, void. I lay down the rule with these restrictions, though I know it is generally laid down more largely, that acts of Parliament contrary to reason are void. But if the Parliament will positively enact a thing to be done which is unreasonable, 
I know of no power that can control it. And the examples usually alleged in support of this sense of the rule do none of them prove that where the main object of a statute is unreasonable, the judges are at liberty to reject it, for that were to set the judicial power above that of the legislature, which would be subversive of all government. But where some collateral matter arises out of the general words, and happens to be unreasonable, there the judges are in decency, to conclude that this consequence was not foreseen by the Parliament, and therefore they are at liberty to expound the statute by equity, and only quod hoc disregard it. Thus, if an act of Parliament gives a man power to try all causes that arise within his manner of dale, yet, if a cause should arise in which he himself is party, the act is construed not to extend to that, because it is unreasonable that any man should determine his own quarrel. But, if we could conceive it possible for the Parliament to enact that he should try as well his own causes as those of other persons, there is no court that has power to defeat the intent of the legislature, when couched in such evident and express words, as leave no doubt whether it was the intent of the legislature or not. These are the several grounds of the laws of England, over and above which equity is also frequently called in to assist, to moderate, and to explain it. What equity is, and how impossible in its very essence to be reduced to stated rules, has been shown in the preceding section. I shall therefore only add that there are courts of this kind established for the benefit of the subject to correct and soften the rigor of the law when through its generality it bears too hard in particular cases to detect and punish latent frauds which the law is not minute enough to reach to enforce the execution of such matters of trust and confidence as are binding in conscience though perhaps not strictly legal, to deliver from such dangers as are owing to misfortune or oversight, and, in short, to relieve in all such cases as are, bona fide, objects of relief. This is the business of our courts of equity, which, however, are only conversant in matters of property, for the freedom of our Constitution will not permit that in criminal cases a power should be lodged in any judge to construe the law otherwise than according to the letter. This caution, while it admirably protects the public liberty, can never bear hard upon individuals. A man cannot suffer more punishment than the law assigns, but he may suffer less. The laws cannot be strained by partiality to inflict a penalty beyond what the letter will warrant. But... In cases where the letter induces any apparent hardship, the Crown has the power to pardon. End of section 10